We're going to skip that uh, again and uh, move on. Just wasn't meant to play. You also notice uh, in the pews, I'd mentioned this last Sunday, uh, we've done away with the red vinyl uh, folders. We've gone to blue. And I know that's a big change, but just kidding. This is the big change on the inside, right? If you've looked at this already, you notice this is starkly different from what we've done in the past. Uh, this is going to give us an opportunity uh, to do a number of different things, including getting prayer requests from people. We're also going to give you here in just a second a couple minutes to actually fill these out. One of the things that uh, most churches struggle with is keeping accurate attendance. Um, many of the medium to larger churches all use Connect cards today. Um, it's a great way to gather information. And we're going to be intentional about giving you the time to fill them out. And so in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do that. If you just tear one sheet out, fill it out. Give it, give it to the books to the person next to you so they can tear one out and fill it out. And then the ushers will come forward down the middle aisle. And if you want to just fold it, pass it to the center, they will collect them. And um, Sheila will be playing some music during that time. Let me, let me just sh share with you also that um, the importance of keeping track of attendance isn't just to track numbers. It helps us identify people who are new in the church so we can reach out to them effectively. It also helps us as a church identify you who haven't been in church for a while. So we can reach out to you and see if there's something that we can do to help you, if there's something going on in your life. Um, so there's a pastoral element to it as well. And so I'd strongly encourage you to make sure you fill these out every Sunday. Um, these next next Sunday or next couple of Sundays, would you do me a favor and fill out all your information, your address, uh, cell phone? That way we can be checking in our records and verifying our records are ac accurate um, in our church window system. We'd appreciate that. Um, also, I don't think Levi mentioned it, the organ uh, is not working today. Uh, Sheila got up there, turned it on, and it, uh, it did everything but smoke, right? Yeah, okay. So we were having some organ issues, so we will not have organ this morning. Levi? Go ahead and grab your cards. Start filling them out. And uh, pass it to the center aisle. Sorry.
So if you guys have those done, you can pass them into the center aisles and the ushers will pick them up. If, um, if you're taking time to write a prayer request or, or, or a God moment on them, the baskets will be in the back if you didn't get a chance to complete these. So on your way out this morning, if you want to, if you didn't get a chance to completely fill them out, you can throw them in there when we're done with, this, uh, with the service as well. And so with that, we will stand and we'll shake hands and greet those that are around us. to center ourselves for worship. <coughs> Now would you please remain standing and join with me in our responsive call to worship. Come, gather together and let us give God praise. Let us sing of God's love and God's amazing grace. May we give God praise for God's forgiveness and mercy. Let us sing of God's justice and compassion. May we give God praise for all the wondrous acts from God to all the earth's people. Let us sing of our praises to God and worship God with our hearts and minds fully. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See, found on the screen or in the hymnals on page 454. Please remain standing and join me in our unison opening prayer. Lord God, we come to adore you. You are our creator. Without you, we could not be. Before we were born, before time began, you were. 
when, when time is finished, when, when the universe is no more, you will still be. Nothing can take your power from you. Nothing can limit or overcome your love, and no words of ours can do justice to your glory. For this we give you praise. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. We have the gospel choir back, so we get to take a moment to listen to them. with us this morning. Uh, before, we, before we get into our prayers, I wanted to give just a quick update. Uh, if you were at the football game on Friday night, you've seen a kind of a scary accident. Elijah Frosch got taken off the field um, on, on, on the backboard, and he had to go to the hospital. He got a stinger while he was out on the game, um, and he wasn't awake for a couple of minutes, but they said that it was mainly precautionary, uh, and they got him to the hospital, and he was able to go home that night, so we want to give God praise for for it not being as bad as it could have been. So he is home, he is recovering, and so we'll pray for a safe and a speedy recovery for him as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a beautiful day that we get to come and worship you. Lord, we pray for, for more of these temperatures and more of this sunshine just to last into the, the last days of summer and those early days of fall, God. And we pray that as we start to look towards harvest, that you're with all of the farmers and, and the ranchers and all of their families, Lord. As, as we know this year has been a tough year, Lord, we just pray for a, just for a successful harvest, Lord. And we pray for no accidents. We pray for a safe one, too. So, God, as we look towards that, we pray that you would be there in that situation. 
And we thank you for Elijah being able to go home, Lord. We pray for a safe and speedy recovery. And we pray that you can get back out on the field, God, and, and, and play the sport that he loves so much. Lord, and we thank you for Krista. She's now back in Haiti. We just pray that she can be a walking testimony for all that you have done in her life. And we think about all the marriages, Lord, that are, are going through a hard time right now, God. We pray that you would enter into those marriages. Enter into the husbands and the wives' hearts, God, and just model or help them to model, model their relationship after you. One of love, one of service, one of grace. We thank you for Mary getting uh, the best results she's got back in, in a long time, God. We just pray that you would continue to give her good health. And we thank you for Aiden being healed and, uh, and is doing great, Lord. We also give you praise for Nancy being home, Lord, and recovering. We, just, we pray that you continue to walk with her, Lord, and we just thank you for her recovery. Lord, continue to please be with Charlie. As he goes through this, God, help him to know that he doesn't fight alone, that you're there with him and that he has a congregation that loves him. So continue to walk with him, Lord, and work in his body to heal him. And for Blake's Aunt Rosie, God, we just pray for, for, um, for just a, a good healing, Lord, a good and fast healing. And for Shelly, God, we thank you for uh, just the improvement she's made and, and for her and Dave getting to go and spend time with their granddaughter, Lord. We just give you the praise for that. God, we thank you for Dorothy and Francis, especially in our care centers today, Lord. But we also want to remember the rest of, of, our, of our members that are in those care centers, God. And for all those people that are there, we just pray that you continue to let them know that they're so loved and they're so cared for. Put it on our hearts, God, to go and spend time with them and to hear their stories and to share ours with them as well. And as Brittany and Sean are on campus, Lord, as they are uh, reaching out to students, we just pray that you give them the boldness and the, and the courage just to continue telling others about you. God, we thank you for their commitment to serve you, and we pray that we can just stay behind them, Lord, with our prayers and our support. We pray for our brothers and sisters over at American Lutheran. God, we just pray that uh, you continue to lead them in a way that you'd be proud of. We thank you for Pastor Justin being over there, and we pray that you bless him today, Lord, and help him to give a message for those in this church to go home and, and to grow closer to you. God, we thank you for our, our church and just the the regular routine that we're getting back into. We pray that this year for Sunday school and for Wednesday nights that you would work in the lives of all of those that are there. For the youth, the children, the teachers, the adults, God, we just pray that as a, as a whole, we can just continue to have spiritual growth in our own lives. So Lord, I pray now that you bless Pastor Tom as he gives a message today. Help it to be one that we can all take into our week and just glorify you with it. So we pray in the way that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise as we sing our next hymn, Standing on the Promises, found on the screen or in the hymnals on page 374. <laughs>
Please be seated. This morning's scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and, and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. I'd like the children to come up for a few minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're a tough crowd, aren't you? Ready? Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Um, you know, I think I've shared this with, with the church before. Uh, it's been a while, though. One of the things I like to do, I have a lot of hobbies. One of my hobbies is collecting coins. And I like to collect all kinds of coins. And I have four uh, coins in my pocket here that I wanted to show you. They're actually Benjamin Franklin 50 cent pieces. Have you seen those before? Have you? Yeah. I have four of them. Wait. Three. Three. I had four. When I came into church this morning, I had four. All right. I lost one. And you know, these are real silver. These aren't cheap. These are worth some money. And I've lost one. So you guys want to do me a favor? You want to help me find it? No. Please? Okay, all right. The only place is, yeah, John, John took it. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So the only places I've really been is I've been sitting over there and I've been sitting over here. So would you guys mind looking real quick? You found it? Are you serious? Really? You did find it. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. I was a little worried there. I'm very happy now. Thank you very much for finding that. Um, have you guys ever lost anything before? Yes. Were you sad when you lost it? Have you ever lost anything and then found it again? Yes. And how did you feel when you found it? Good. Yeah, happy. It makes, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? You know what's awesome about Jesus? Is that... He gets happy when he finds people who are lost and, and they come to him and know him. And he celebrates that. You know, there's a lot of people in our world that, that are lost and don't know Jesus. And um, I know in my life, I get to experience uh, every once in a while people coming to know Jesus for the first time. And it excites me too. And we get to be a part of that. 
We get to be a part of helping people get to know Jesus, help them find Jesus. And I wanna encourage you to do that, the older you get, to just share peop with people your story about Jesus. And you're gonna experience a great amount of joy too. I promise you that, okay? Let's pray. Loving God, Lord, we, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much that uh, we, we know him and we have a relationship with him and we pray that we can help others um, know him and have a relationship with him too. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, anybody like a sucker? Ladies first. You know, I learned something interesting uh, this week. Um, I learned that in, in London, they actually have an official government office for lost and found. Some people knew that. They're shaking their head. They knew that. Um, and it's really, m for the most part, for the transit system, so for the buses and, and trains and those kinds of things. That uh, They've had this, though, since 1933, um, and, and they just simply call it lost property office. Now, every year, this lost property office receives 150 to 200,000 items. 150 to, so that's, it's got to be close to 150 to 200,000 people, unless the same people are losing, the same, <laughs> losing things. But for the most part, it's 150 to 200,000 people in London every year losing something just on the transit system. And some of the things that, that have been turned into this uh, lost property office are things like wheelchairs. Uh, how do you lose a wheelchair, right? How about false teeth? <laughs> you would think you would know if you lost your, your teeth or not. But some more common ones are watches, backpacks, lunch boxes, umbrellas, cell phones. We expect those kinds of things. Um, between 2009 and uh, 2010, they found 38,000 books, 29,000 bags, and 28,000 pieces of clothing. Now, if you're shocked by the, the wheelchair and the, and the false teeth, if you think those are odd, the office has also received, not just uh, one occasion, but on multiple occasions, they've received urns with human remains in them. They've, they had somebody turn in a suitcase full of money, a human skull, and a lawnmower. <laughs> you know, I think, and I'm just taking a stab in the dark, but I'm pretty confident that everyone in this room has lost something uh, at one time or another in their lives. I sure hope it wasn't your false teeth or, or lawnmower, but... Um, we've, we've all lost things. And, and we all know the frustration that can come when we lose something, the disappointment, the sadness, uh, the heartache that comes from that. And I think this is especially true if we lose something that has either financial value to it or sentimental value to it, especially. It can be heartbreaking if we lose something with financial value. Now imagine if you... Uh, if you lived in, in London and you lost the urn of, of a loved one, it would be, it'd be hard, wouldn't it? Now imagine if you go to the, the property office there, the lost property office, and guess what? There it is. Lo and behold, they have it. Imagine the amount of excitement you, you would feel. The, the overwhelming joy. And perhaps even some relief, right? How do you explain that to your family, right? So maybe even some relief. My point is this. We all know what it's like to lose 
uh, something, especially if something of great value. But what about yourself? What about yourself? Have you ever been really lost? I'm not talking about driving around Sioux Falls trying to find the mall lost. I'm talking about physically lost someplace. Raise your hand if you've ever been physically lost. Yeah, so, so I, I'm in good company. Yeah. I recall uh, a number of years ago, I was 20 years old, and I, I went hunting with my not yet father-in-law um, down in the Badlands in North Dakota. And I didn't have a tag, so I was just there helping him out. Um, and we came across this area that looked, looked really good, and he asked if I would walk down and, and kind of come around this loop of this area and just kind of push the deer uh, toward him. So I took off. And uh, I found myself, if you've ever been down to the Badlands, I mean, walking in the Badlands, they have these washouts, and they're about anywhere from 10 to 15 feet uh, deep, and they run from 5 to maybe even 20 feet wide, and a lot of times they're just straight up, the sides are. But I found a way to get down into one of those, and I thought I was going to take this shortcut around and get up this other area. Well, <laughs> you know how that ended up, right, if I'm telling the story already. I couldn't find a way to get out. I couldn't find a way to get out. I couldn't find a way to get out. And pretty soon, a half hour came and went. An hour came and went. And let me tell you this. Uh, many of you don't know this, but I used to chew tobacco. And before I left, I put a big old chew in. And my mouth was getting extremely dry. <laughs> and I had that speckling of chew scattered all over my mouth. I was feeling miserable. And I was starting to get scared. And finally, I see a little, little path where, where deer had been coming down along the side into that, that washout. And I climbed out of that, and I looked around, and I was clueless to where I was at. I couldn't see anything. Well, I could see things. I could see hills, brush, and trees, and that was it. I was turned around, mixed up. And I look out to the west, and I got about an hour of sunlight left by now. I'd left at 12, by the way. I have about an hour of sunlight, and I see a, a tall hill, so I go over to the tall hill, and by the time I get up to that, there's another 15 minutes shaved off, so I'm looking at maybe 45 minutes tops, and I'm scanning and scanning, and I don't see anything. So I go over to the next hill. By the time I get to the next hill, I only have about 15 minutes left till that sun goes down. And I'm scared, right? I'm terrified. A lot of crazy things were going through my mind, and none of them were good. And then I see a, a, a reflection of the sun, like it was reflecting off of some metal. And my first thought was, oh, I hope that's Bob. I hope that's his vehicle. And then I thought to myself, I don't care if it's Bob's vehicle or not. That's not a hill. It's not a brush. It's not a tree. It's something man-made. And uh, I start walking and walking and walking. And just as the sun gets down, I get up to the top of another hill, and I see off in the distance this, this orange something waving in the, in the air. And I grab my binoculars, and I look, and it's my father-in-law waving, hoping that I would see him, right? But he's facing this way. I'm over, <laughs> way over here looking at it this way. But um, I, I never felt so much relief in my life. I never felt... Uh, probably, I don't know if I felt more terrified in my life or not. There's been times I've been terrified, but I was scared. If anybody knows about the Badlands, there's a lot of coyotes, there's mountain lions. Um, I had nothing on me to speak of. I thought I was just going to go for this quick half-hour walk. It was terrifying. Now, uh, for those of you who are hunters and are wondering, no, I did not spook any deer to my father-in-law. He didn't get a shot, if that was your concern. You know, as I said, I had a lot of crazy thoughts going through my mind. But when I got to that vehicle, when I found my way back, it, it was like life started all over again. I was ecstatic. I was, I was relieved. 
In this morning scripture, Jesus tells us two different parables in response to, to some Pharisees and scribes' uh, very derogatory comments about Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And both of these parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, both highlight the joy and the celebration that comes from finding something that we thought was lost. The truth is there is great joy in finding a lost coin. There's great joy in finding a lost sheep. There's great joy in finding a lost urn or finding your way back when you've been physically lost. As great as it is finding the sheep, the coin, whatever it may be, Jesus tells us there's even greater joy when one sinner repents and through that repentance, there's rejoicing in heaven. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God every time you and I or anyone else repents. The tax collectors, those sinners Jesus was hanging out, that's what they were doing. Out of their brokenness, they were drawing near to Jesus Christ. They're growing in their relationship with him. They're seeking his help. They're seeking forgiveness as they repented of their sins. This is in contrast to the Pharisees, those scribes who held fast to, to their ritualistic ways, which from their perspective, those ritualistic ways freed them from their sin. And yet they weren't freed from their sin. Jesus knew this. He knew their hearts and the great lengths they went to to, to promote themselves and to look good, to be self-righteous, to give the appearance of being sin-free. And so when we read or hear Jesus telling the Pharisees and scribes, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. He's saying it because they couldn't or wouldn't acknowledge that they were just as much sinners as the ones they looked down on like the tax collectors. A foundational truth of our faith is this. We're all sinners. We all fall short. And, and we need repentance in our lives in order to receive forgiveness. Now I think we all have a great idea, an understanding of what, what sin is. But to be clear, Sin is missing the mark of God's standard. It's anything that goes against God's ways. That's sin. In order to, to know God's standards, and in order to know God's ways, we have to look to Scripture. I know that may sound trivial, right? Look at the Pharisees. They're known for implementing and enforcing laws and rituals that weren't scriptural. They would distort scripture to fit their laws and their rituals. If a person didn't follow those laws, didn't follow those rituals, they were judged as being unclean or as being sinners. We can't allow anything outside of scripture to determine what sin is for us. Another point is that if we want really to be a repentant people, if we want that in our lives, if we want that forgiveness that comes from being repentant, we have to go to scripture to find out God's standards and God's ways. And if we don't, we can find ourselves going through life, going about doing life in sin and not even be aware of it because we haven't gone to Scripture. We haven't identified what sin is. Now, 
Now, it's one thing to identify and acknowledge our sin. But again, there has to be the sense of repentance in order to receive the forgiveness. And we know this to be true. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, this is following Jesus' death and resurrection. He comes to his disciples and he tells them that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name uh, to all nations. He makes it a commandment to his disciples. In the Gospel of Matthew 4.17, Jesus tells us, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus commands his disciples to proclaim the need for repentance, and he calls all of us to repentance, which precedes the forgiveness of sins. And when we're talking about repentance here, we're talking about uh, turn and return. I just read this this week. I kind of liked it. Turn and return. That's what we're talking about. Remorsefully turning away from sin and joyfully returning to God. It's not to stay in that sin. It's not to ask for forgiveness and, and go about living our lives the same way. Now, granted, some sins can be very difficult for us and it'll take us many, many attempts uh, to be repentant. But this is what separates us as sinners. We're willing to acknowledge that we're lost sinful people. And so we turn away from our sin. We seek repentance from God. Our God who wants nothing more than to give it to us. Good news, the good news in all of this is, is that once we recognize our sin and, and we repent, sincerely from our hearts repent through the grace of Jesus Christ we are forgiven. We're forgiven of our sins. It's not a question. It's not a debate. We are forgiven. Every time you and I repent, did you hear this in this scripture? This is a very powerful thing, and I'm not gonna preach on it. In fact, I'm almost done. But I want you to contemplate this and think about this. Every time you and I repent, Scripture tells us there's rejoicing in heaven. Little old me, every time I repent, God's up there celebrating with the angels. That's pretty cool. Would you please uh, bow your heads in prayer? God, you are an incredibly loving and an incredibly compassionate and uh, wonderful God, and Lord... I, I can't even fathom why you would even want to celebrate over my repentance. But I am thankful for it. And I'm thankful that you have given us a means uh, to, to grow in our relationship with you, to, to experience your love in ways maybe we have never considered. We thank you so much, Lord, that we have this incredible gift, this grace of Jesus Christ, whom we have forgiveness. Lord, let each and every day of ours be reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ did die for the cross for us and that we do have this awesome, awesome gift. So help us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to, to consider and think about the sin in our lives and to, to lift it up to you in repentance as we seek forgiveness and, uh, and grow in relationship with your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Let's uh, stand and join in singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. It's in the green book, uh, 3104, and up on the screen.
Would you join with me now in our unison affirmation of faith? We believe in God who promises to be with us always in all our seasons of life. We believe God wants to fill us with power so we may be witnesses to all the ends of the earth. God's love is stronger than our fears, more enduring than our worries, and deeper than our despair. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the hidden power of God, working for good, bringing hope, encouraging justice, building peace, promoting healing, creating joy. And we believe God is at work in us and in this community. At this moment, we'll take our morning offering. <coughs> Please join me in our unison offertory prayer. God of unending grace, although there are times in our lives when we question why and when we wander from our path of faith, we still are forever grateful for this gift of life that is ours. And we now pray that what we give will make this world better. We give our gifts, therefore, with grateful hearts, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, Take Time to Be Holy, found on the screen or in the hymnals on page 395.
interesting coincidence is that, you know, I, I found uh, my father-in-law in the vehicle out hunting when I was 20 years old. I was also 20 years old when I found Jesus. And um, I've been repenting ever since, you guys. <laughs> uh, so I share that with you because we never fully arrive, right? But, but we, we do have this, should have this inherent desire to be a repentant people and grow closer in our faith with our, our loving and gracious God, right? All right, amen. We'll see you next week. God bless you.